personal experience and then the nonlinear uh, Yamadi problem on manifold boundaries. Okay, so um, thank you very much for your introduction and I would like to thank the organizers, Alice, Luis, and uh, Matt for inviting me here. Okay, so today I'm uh, going to talk about the uh, conformal invariant and the relative problem, especially the nonlinear Yamadi problem on manifolds with boundaries. So uh, what, we want, what do we want to study? So consider a compact manifold, and we would like to understand the conformal structure on the manifold and in a way that we want to find a canonical matrix in the conformal class. Or sometimes we say that we want to find a good uh, representative in the conformal class. And uh, geometrically, it can be viewed as a classification problem in conformal sense. Analytically, in order to find a canonical match, you usually need to solve uh, a nice PDE. So uh, let's start from some uh, well-known uh, uh, result in a conformal geometry. Okay, so the, the problem is called the Yamavi problem. And the Yamavi problem consists of uh, finding a metric in a conformal class, such that the scalar curvature equal to constant. So this problem was uh, proposed by Yamabe himself. He solved, uh, uh, he solved part of the problem. And then it was uh, studied by Trudinger, Ovan. And uh, finally, it was completely solved uh, by Rickson. Okay. So uh, as I said, that it can be viewed as a classification problem because uh, it says that every Riemannian manifold is conformal to a constant scalar curvature manifold. So this picture is very good uh, because uh, it solved the problem completely and uh, it's very clear what's happening. Uh, however, um, so however later we would like to, uh, to get some uh, more refined classification that uh, I will explain later. So this problem, uh, in turn, um, analytically, it's related to a uh, semi-linear elliptic equation. So if we write the conformal metric to be uh, three to the four over a minus two g, then it is equivalent to solve the following semi-linear elliptic equation. So this is a critical power, and the where k is a constant. Okay, and uh, this problem is variational, and we can consider the following functional integration of the scalar curvature. And then you take uh, the metric in the conformal class such that the value is fixed. And this is called the Yamabe constant. So since we take uh, all the metric in the conformal class, it's, that it's obviously a conformal invariant. And uh, you can check that if you do the uh, variation, conformal variation of this functional, you find that uh, the critical metric of this functional would be would satisfy this equation. So the problem is variational. Okay. So uh, this is what we know. Uh, this is a linear one. So why do okay, wait. So um, so this is very good. However, um, the scalar curvature is uh, quite weak. Although we know that it's conformal to the constant scalar curvature metric, but it does not say too much about the information of the manifold. Therefore, we would like to know more. For it, okay, in the sense that we want to under we want to get information of the Ricci curvature. Okay, and uh, so it's kind of more refined uh, study of the of uh, of the manifold. So we want to study the Ricci curvature. So let me introduce uh, a tensor. This is called uh, the Shorten tensor. Uh, it's basically s it's some combination of the scalar curvature uh, and the Ricci curvature. And uh, this uh, tensor coming from the curvature decomposition. That is, if you write uh, your Riemannian curvature tensor, which is a full tensor, into the trace list part, we call the wild tensor. And uh, then you have uh, some tra trace part here. And the trace part can be written as some uh, product of the shortened tensor and the metric, such that it had the same symmetry as the curvature. Okay, and uh, uh, 
the good thing, uh, the interesting about this tensor is that uh, first, uh, if you take the trace, then it just gives you uh, the multiple of the scalar curvature. Okay. So the Yamabe problem can be viewed as you just uh, consider the trace of the sharpened tensor. And uh, on the other hand, the sharpened tensor itself has the uh, information of Ricci. That's why we would like to study it. Okay. So now a natural question would be following. So instead of taking the trace, you would like to understand others, uh, say the other symmetric function. You take the sigma k. Sigma k means the case elementary symmetric functions of the eigenvalue of this, of this tensor. And uh, we would like to ask the same question, that is whether we can uh, find a metric in a conformal <laughs> class such that sigma k equal to constant. Okay, and uh, just like before, I mean, it will, this is, uh, it will become, uh, if you write the uh, conformal change of the metric, then it would give you a fully nonlinear equation now. So the equation would look at the following. So the leading term will be a Hessian equation. And then you have uh, some gradient terms. We write the conformal metric to be equal to the two u g, e to the minus two u g. Is that equal? Okay. So uh, if you take the trace that is sigma one, and then you will reproduce the the Yamabe equation, Yam, Yamabe equation. And if you take a uh, uh, k equal to n, that is the determinant, that is the modern pair equation. And uh, you will also want to know what is in between. Okay. So this is a free nonlinear equation. And uh, the motivation of a another motivation study this is uh, coming from the four-dimensional gauss bonnet formula. That is, uh, the Euler uh, characteristic can be written as uh, the, the integration of the curvature. And uh, you can write, uh, there are many ways to write it. One way is to use the curvature decomposition to write the integration of a curvature into trace this part and the trace part. So we will write in that way. And then we get that uh, uh, you have a wild square part, and then you have a sigma 2 of uh, shorten tensor. That's why it is, uh, this is another motivation to study it. And uh, the important thing of the chain gauss bonnet formula is the following. Uh, we know that uh, you can check directly this is a local conforming invariant. So, and of course, the oral characteristic is the invariant. So that means that this part is a conformal invariant. The integration is a conformal invariant. Okay. Okay. Then, okay. So some literature. This was it was proved by Chen Gursky and the Young in O2 that uh, in dimension four. If uh, the Yamabe constant is positive and uh, the integration of a sigma 2 is also positive, then you can find the metric in the conformal class such that uh, a sigma 2 curvature is a positive constant. Okay, and uh, the important thing here is that uh, uh, this was implied the reach of this met conformal metric is positive. So let, let, let uh, explain why we want to study short-term tensor, because as I mentioned, scalar curve information on scalar curvature too weak. We want the information of a rich curvature. Okay, that would be more rigid. So, and another important is that uh, uh, it's a kind of sub clarification because uh, you, you restrict uh, your manifold into a uh, subclass of the, com I mean, in, in the Yamabe problem, you can solve it. Uh, in any conformal class. But uh, if I want the information of Ricci, of course I have to restrict it in the smaller class. That would make more sense. So, but the important thing is that you need to put conformal invariant condition. That is important because it's kind of a classification problem. So the important thing is that here the conditions are conformally invariant. Okay. And, uh, and analytically, it also says that, uh, okay, you want to solve the PBE pointwisely. But in order to solve that, you only need to assume weak uh, integral condition that would imply you can solve the PBE point wise. Okay. All right. Yes? 
it's a compound manifold without boundary. Without boundary, without boundary. Okay. So, and, and uh, you will, would like to ask uh, a natural question because uh, here um, the Yamavi problem is variational, then you would like to ask whether you have a variational formulation. And, uh, and uh, it was uh, proved by Vyakovsky in 2000 that uh, when n not equal to 4, and uh, the critical metric to, to the functional, so let me define the, the functional uh, to be integration of a sigma k. And uh, you want to study the class when the volume is, the, the <coughs> volume is fixed. Okay. Then the critical metric uh, to the, the functional restrict to a fixed uh, value would uh, satisfy sigma 2 equal to constant. And uh, in the more general case, uh, co assuming the manifold is locally conforming flat, then the critical metric to this functional would uh, satisfy sigma k equal to constant. So one would uh, want to know why uh, we would need to, need to have a condition n not equal to 4, because it's come from the gauss bonnet formula. When n equal to 4, this is always a constant. Of course, it's not, uh, you cannot get anything from constant. So, so let's say that this is different from the Yamabe problem in the sense that uh, in, in the critical one, that is n equal to 4, the it's not, uh, I mean, you probably need to find something else in my variation, but uh, this functional is not uh, variational. But uh, if it's not uh, equal to four, then it's variational. Okay. So, so now uh, you want to ask uh, how about the uh, manifold suit boundary? So, manifolds with boundary. Okay. So let me introduce a uh, definition. Just recall, we said uh, a boundary is uh, umbilic. That means uh, the second fundamental form is equal to a function times the metric. So it just means, uh, so this is just the, the principal curvatures. And the umbilic condition says that uh, at each point, the principal curvatures are all the same. So it's a symmetric. Uh, it means uh, it's a symmetric. Okay, and uh, this is a conformal invariant condition. Okay. So there are some literatures. Uh, this is what we know. So let's uh, restart by Escobar in 92. That uh, he studied the Yamabe problem and made for boundary uh, in the sense that uh, he want to study the problem uh, that uh, to solve a scalar curvature equal to constant and the mean curvature equal to zero on the boundary, okay? And uh, in this, his paper, he basically proved uh, almost every manifold, but uh, it's just some cases he has not proved. So in particular, for example, the lower dimension case is good. And uh, for example, a uh, local conforming flight case with umbilic boundary is uh, also good, such and such, okay? And uh, can I use this? Okay. And uh, similarly, uh, we also can define the uh, Yamabe constant on manifold boundary. So we can also consider the integration of a scalar curvature, but uh, this time you have uh, some boundary term because you need to put uh, your mean curvature there. And then you take the inf and, uh, and uh, uh, fix the value of the manifold. Then this is uh, called the Yamabe constant on manifold boundary. Okay. And uh, the same thing you can show that uh, uh, the equation I just erased is variational. I mean, for this uh, boundary very problem, you just take a first variation of this and then the critical uh, metric uh, will satisfy the, the equation and the weight mean curvature equal to zero on the boundary. 
So this is variation. Okay. okay. So, so this is a linear version. And uh, of course, uh, uh, in this case, it's no doubt that uh, uh, if we consider the scalar curvature equation, then the mean curvature equation will be a matching boundary condition on the energy boundary condition. I mean, this is very clear for, for this. Okay. So now we are getting into uh, some trouble. Okay. So this is what uh, we don't know. Suppose uh, we consider the sigma k curvature. Okay, then what is the matching cover matching condition on the boundary? Okay, and uh, if you look at the list, okay, so this scalar curvature is a sigma one of uh, shortened tensor. Mean curvature is sigma one of uh, the second fundamental form. So the easiest answer you can guess is the following. You will guess uh, maybe I should just uh, put the sigma k of the second fundamental form. Okay, this is a very natural guess. However, uh, obviously, not obviously, but uh, this is not uh, the right answer. Otherwise, it will not uh, take a lot of work to work on that. So, <laughs> so uh, however, this is not, it's, although it's a wrong answer, but it's not so wrong in the sense that we are really looking for something symmetric. Although it's not that easy, but uh, we really like uh, something symmetric. Uh, how, how do you tell the difference between the right answer and the wrong answer? Say it again? Uh, how, how do you know the difference between the right answer and the wrong answer? When you say that's the wrong answer, what's... Uh, you want it to be variational. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so yeah. Can, you, can you say again what scale it is? Second fundamental form oh, okay. of the boundary. Okay. okay. Uh, L will be a second fundamental form. Yeah, H will be mean curvature. I'm sorry. Maybe some people have different notation, but uh, yeah. <laughs> so in order to investigate uh, what is this question mark, let's look at the gauss ponte bonier again, but this time with boundary. So in dimension four, in the square, the gauss ponte formula for many with boundary will be the following. It's boundary. Okay, there's some boundary term, of course. And uh, just like before, uh, this part is uh, conformal invariant. Okay, and uh, this, uh, this boundary term is uh, very complicated. Okay. I will just uh, mention that the uh, boundary term once, and then you are allowed to forget it. Okay, so this boundary term is uh, um, it's basically the curvature product with a second fundamental form, but uh, there are also some terms that is only involve a second fundamental form. Okay, this is the boundary term. All right, so this is um, the first result in dimension four. Assume the boundary is umbilic and uh, assume the Yamabe constant is positive and the integration of a sigma 2 plus the boundary term okay, is also positive. Then we can find uh, a conformal metric such that uh, sigma 2 curvature is uh, a positive constant and uh, this uh, curvature is zero on the boundary. So, okay. So what does that mean? Uh, okay. So in particular, that would imply the reach is positive and the boundary is uh, totally geodesic. Okay. So uh, again, just like uh, before, uh, the condition here are all conformally invariant, so again, it's a classification problem, and uh, and then we want to find a good uh, good uh, metric that is scalar uh, sigma two curvature to constant metric with uh, uh, th some curvature is zero on the boundary, but in this case, it's actually just total geodesic. Okay, so. Um, yes. Yeah, I mean, yes, B would come from divergent structure because, uh, 
Yes, because it has to be a invariant. Yeah, but it's not unique. So I will explain later. Yes. Yeah, no more current, but uh, as I said, you can forget about the definition very soon. In fact, yeah, I want to. C just means summation. Oh, I use Einstein convention. If you see repeating, that means, uh, and the ABC will be tangential indices. But uh, really, I mean, later you can forget very soon. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So. So you said, back to the question I asked before, you said that in the bound conditions. Right. It's not a variational. Okay. I mean, I mean it's constant. Right. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's so constant. So then I'll ask my other question again. Yeah. So I that's why I, I I need to compute something later. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You are one or two step in, in ahead of me. Yeah. That is good. <laughs> so okay. I just want to explain. Okay. And uh, okay. And the analytically, of course, is the free nonlinear equation with some boundary condition. Later, I will show it's actually a Neumann boundary condition. So it's a Neumann problem for free nonlinear equation. Okay, so let me just uh, digress just a little bit to talk about the uh, uh, an application. Okay, so consider a conformally compact Einstein manifold uh, with uh, Conformal infinity, so I will explain the definitions later. And suppose uh, the Yamabe constant of the conformal infinity is positive, and uh, the renormalized volume is also positive, then there exists a compatibil conformal compatibilization of this manifold such that. The sigma two curvature is a positive constant, and uh, the boundary is uh, totally geodesic. So this means again. Uh, this means again the region is positive. Okay, so I will just briefly. I I, I will not go into detail of that. So the conformal compact Einstein manifold just asymptotic hyperbolic Einstein manifold, which can be conformally compactified. That means you can do a conformal change of real metric, such that it is a compact manifold's boundary. And uh, so I since the compactification is not unique, uh, you change the conformal factor, then it will induce uh, some uh, the it will induce a conformal structure of the at the infinity is called a conformal infinity. A conformal infinity. And uh, the whole setting is conformal invariant. And if you assume the, the three-dimensional Yamabe constant is positive, and the renormalized value, which is just some const, some coefficient in the expansion of the value, uh, which is turned out to be conformal invariant. If you assume this is also positive, then you can find a compatibilization, conformal compatibilization such that uh, the ridge is positive, and the boundary is totally geodesic. And uh, yeah, so it just say that, and, and just say that the assume some conform invariant condition, you can actually get the richly positive compactification. And uh, to, to relate this to that, you just uh, use the uh, result by J. Ching to relate the three-dimensional Yamabe to four-dimensional Yamabe. So here is the four-dimensional Yamabe. And the then there's a uh, work by Anderson Which says that the renormalized value is basically this, this quantity. Okay, and the length will have that result. So since it's a PD workshop, I will not go into too much geometry details. <laughs> okay, so let me go back uh, to the our problem. So I promised uh, Matt I have to do some computation. All right, so. So we want to find the matching curvature to the sigma k curvature. So this is my okay. So let me define the following. Because uh, this curvature comes from Gauss money, but uh, it uh, look uh, too ugly. We want some neat form. Okay. So let me define the following. Okay. So 
I explain. So A is a shortened tensor, but now I'm on the boundary, so I can just uh, consider the tangential part of shortened tensor. And L is the second fundamental form. And what does that mean? This means uh, mixed symmetric function. So uh, just like determinant, the symmetric function can have a complete uh, uh, expansion. That uh, you have uh, um, I, um, I1, I2, uh, OK, sorry. One. Just uh, consider a uh, uh, complete expansion of the determinant. For symmetric function, you also have that. And the this means that instead of using the same matrix in your formula, you can replace some of them by another matrix. And then it will give you a mixed symmetric function for two matrices. Okay. And uh, like the same is true. You can uh, two, one two one means that the total is uh, two, like sigma two, but one of them is another. Why? So for example, three zero means uh, three zero just means three of uh, L, the second one. Uh, the, the second index is means how many matrices you put uh, for the first one. This is a notation by uh, Robert Reilly. Okay. Okay. So it's an old paper, but it's very very well written. Okay. So okay, let's define this one, and the then. So is there any question for Reilly's paper? No, 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 no. <laughs> but uh, I, I mentioned I follow Reilly's notation. OK, if you can, you probably don't have a chance to argue with him, but uh, this is his notation. <laughs> <laughs> OK. It's independent of A. Zero means how many of the first one? So one means the less one, first one, one a, one a, and the one l, and this means zero a and the three l. Right. Yeah, but the, it is a definition. So <laughs> sigma n i a l would means there are i a's in your formula. Yeah, determinant. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, but you ask me why I choose this uh, notation, I tell you it's not me who chooses this, so it's uh, really who chooses this <laughs> notation. <laughs> okay. Sigma to one is the, the coefficient and A, yeah. and the minus is A. Yes. And sigma to three is also the coefficient of L. So you determine L. <laughs> yes, exactly, okay. So are, are, are people happy with the notation? Um, anyway, it's not my, my problem, but uh, anyway. So to relate this to this, uh, I want to say that uh, by careful computation, you can s check that uh, this is equal to this one plus some local conformal invariant. So it's basically the product of the wild tensor and the trace the second fundamental form. But uh, this is local conformal invariant is harmless in, in our computation. In, in, in Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, at least in N four dimension, exactly. But that is defined for any dimension. Uh, for N greater or equal to four. Okay. Okay. So now I can answer the question what is the variational formula? Okay. So let uh, the functional to be sigma two, integral sigma two, and the integration of this be two. So if n is not equal to 4, and the, the critical metric to this functional would uh, satisfy sigma 2 equal to constant, and uh, this, uh, curvat this curvature equal 0 on the boundary. And uh, in more general, I can define the yeah, okay. bk equal to some summation of those kind of uh, uh, mixed symmetric function. Sigma uh, 2k minus i minus 1i a g l. And uh, these constants are precise. I mean, I have a formula, but I don't want to write it down right now. I, otherwise, you will go sleep. So, so I can define like this. Uh, OK. And the then assume this. Uh, local conformity flat, then the same thing is true. 
the critical metric to this functional would satisfy sigma k equal to constant and uh, this uh, curvature is equal to zero on the boundary. Okay. And, and uh, the same thing hold, uh, so if I add uh, some conformal local conformal invariant with appropriate weight, then the same thing is true because the local conformal invariant does not affect the computation at all. So I in other words, you are free to put the, that's why I say it's not unique. You can put the main, as many local conformal invariants as you want. The same thing is true. Okay. And, and how, how, how do we find this? And so the motivation is the following. If you let the n equal to 2k, then it should uh, come from the gauss bonnet formula, um, ignoring the wild part. So here you see, uh, so here I say that uh, this is the wild part. While times the trace list that they found the form. It's a kind of, uh, this is the trace part in the gauss bonnet formula. The boundary term, I mean, the boundary term. Because this is reasonable because uh, sigma k is the trace part in the gauss bonnet formula. So of course you want to pick out some trace part of the boundary. And that's how you find this, this symmetry function appear because it's appear in the Boltzmann formula, the boundary part. And then, then you want to just find the right coefficient to make this variation. And then, then once you find it, just straightforward. Yeah. Okay, any questions? So to answer the questions, so you have a sigma k, and then you have this, plus any local component variable. Then you have, uh, and uh, you have <coughs> variational characterization. Okay? So here are just the algebra. So now you can really ignore this, as I say, if it's because you have a good formula here. Let one plus some local component value. Okay. So, seeing the rest of the talk, I will focus on the PDE. Okay? I will discuss talk about how to solve uh, the boundary value problem of free nonlinear equations. Okay, so the equations. Okay, so you already know that the, uh, the sigma equation is a free nonlinear equation. And the, the boundary part, as I say, is very complicated. So I will just, again, write it only once. And then you can forget it soon. So it's a low order term. Okay, anyway, I don't care. So <laughs> anyway, the, the boundary, you do the conformal change of the curvature and the boundary term involves the second derivative of the tangential Hessian. Okay, and uh, here is a very nice ob observation. If the boundary is umbilic and the scalar curvature positive, sigma to curvature positive, then this curvature equal to zero if only if the mean curvature equal to zero. So this is not, uh, it's, a, it's kind of a miracle uh, in the sense that the scale of the mean curvature and the least curvature are different. Uh, but uh, if you have ambiguous condition, you write down this, and then you can de decompose into a product. Okay, and then the, the interesting is that the coefficient here is positive because of this condition. So if this is equal to zero, then you can take uh, just uh, this is equal to zero. It's, it's become a product, amazingly, okay. And uh, this one happened to be positive because of the positive cone condition, okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, but it's hold also on the boundary. So in particular, okay, for example, you use the shorten tensor, no. The Newton tensor is positive. It basically use Newton tensor positive and you put, you, you find this is positive. Yeah. All okay. right. So and then I can write down my equation. That is, uh, I have a Hessian equation. I mean, Hessian equation plus gradient terms here. And the length. You do the conformal change of mean curvature, that is just the Neumann boundary condition. Okay, 
So this is my equation. I mean, I like a color chart, but uh, I hate the erasing color chart. Okay, I hope it's clear. Okay. All right. So, uh, so the idea of proving this uh, is uh, to do the deformation. So we we in we are in the positive Yamabe class. So we have a uh, parties get a curvature matrix, and then we want to use uh, a deformation by Gersky and Vyakosi to to move the party scalar cultural matrix to the one set by this equation. And uh, the first thing we want to, I mean, and the layer, of course, we need to get the a priori estimate. Uh, priori estimate. So in our case, everything is smooth, not measurable. But on the other hand, our equation is not uniform elliptic. Okay, just keep in mind. And we want to derive a priori estimate. Okay. And uh, the first thing we want to know is that uh, if we have the soup non bound, and it turns out that uh, it's impossible to have soup non bound because uh, there are broad up solutions on the sphere that like coming from a conformal deformation. So in general, you do not have uh, you do not have soup non bound. But however, uh, the the strategy is the following: you want to say that uh, if your manifold is not a conformal equivalent to the upper hemisphere, then you want to say everything is fine. Okay. And the here is a place you need to use a conformal invariant. To say that uh, uh, what is my okay. You want to say that uh, this conformal invariant can distinguish upper hemisphere from non upper hemisphere. It's just like the Yamabi, the Yamabi problem. Yamabi Yamabe constant can distinguish upper hemisphere than from non-upper hemisphere. That's why you can distinguish them. So this here is the key point we need to use the conformal invariant. Okay. And the length, we want to say that uh, if uh, you satisfy this equation, then you have uh, the C2 bound. And then upper um, other regularity just uh, followed by uh, Evans, Krilov, and the short estimate. That is very standard. So once you have the uh, Hessian bound, everything is fine. Okay. okay. So let me just uh, this give you explain the idea. Okay. So before. For manifold without boundary, uh, without boundary. So it was proved by uh, Chen, Gersky, Yang. I mean the, the estimates. And uh, for sigma k, sigma two equation, and by Guan and Wang for the sigma k equation, and uh, for some variant of sigma k equation by Li and Li. Okay. So their proof would go like following. Uh, assuming the uh, one-sided bound or supernormal bound, you you want to derive uh, the gradient estimate, and then from the gradient estimate, you want to derive the Hessian estimate. That's the usual step. Uh, however, in the proof, you will figure out that uh, the gradient estimate turns out the most uh, complicated part. The Hessian estimate is very complicated. So now uh, we have uh, the boundary. So you can imagine that uh, with the boundary condition, in order to get the gradient estimate, it will be much more uh, difficult. And uh, so now the question is, uh, how do you overcome the gradient estimate on the boundary? Okay. So I'm go I use uh, some non-traditional approach. So in order to get my estimate, so this is what the, the graduate student would do. So suppose you are find some estimate too complicated, so you have two choices. One is that uh, you give up the problem, you work on something else. Another problem is that you just uh, find another way and uh, just don't do that estimate. So I choose the second one. So in, instead of uh, get trying to get the gradient estimate, I just uh, skip the gradient estimate and uh, I derive the C2 estimate directly from zero estimate. And uh, so, so <laughs> So that's why I say it's a non-traditional approach. I, I don't know whether usual advisor would advise a student to do that, but uh, that is how I graduate. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, so in other words, uh, we can jump from C2 
zero to C2, and the length uh, just uh, skip a grade, and it actually is follow as a consequences. Uh, so, and later I, f I find that uh, um, there is a proof by Yao, it's his famous uh, result on the Calabi conjecture for the compass module pair equation. He did something like this. Uh, that is the only analog I can find in the literature. Uh, however, our proof are completely different because his equation is very different from mine and the mine is real, he is a complex and such and such. So, but uh, that is the only analog I can find. All right, so, let me just, uh, uh, maybe I should, uh, uh, okay, I erase this. So I explain how do we derive the boundary estimates. Create a boundary, okay. So there are two parts for the boundary estimates. Okay, the one is that the uh, as I said, I will skip the gradient. Okay, so the only thing I need to get is that I want to bound the Hessian. The first part is that uh, you want to say the maximum of the Hessian cannot uh, happen at uh, the boundary. So we are not, uh, I'm not going to use a barrier function because that does not work. Instead, uh, I'm going to try, I would uh, 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 control a third derivative in the normal direction. And to say that if you have uh, some control of the third derivative, then the maximum of the second derivative cannot happen on the boundary. Okay. And then once we push the maximum to the interior, then we just uh, derive a C2 estimate directly from zero in the interior. Okay. And uh, here you will see there will be a magic cancellation, such as this one is possible. All right. So let me just uh, state. Uh, so turn out this method, this part is, uh, is the method is applicable to more general equations. So I just uh, state the result. And then I just give you an idea how do you, how do you skip the gradient estimate. So consider the following more general free nonlinear equation. It was satisfied the usual condition. This is concave, monotone, and homogeneous degree one, and such and such. Okay, and the then uh, under such a condition, I assume B and the A plus and B are both negative. Then I have this uh, local estimate, the gradient, and the Hessian are bounded by a constant, uh, where this is this depend on the serial norm, the supernorm of U. So you get the gradient Hessian bound in terms of uh, the supernorm bound. Okay, and uh, for more general free nonlinear equation. Okay, I just state, state, state that, okay. So, so let me just uh, give you a baby case. Uh, to give you a test how the things work. Okay. It turns out the computation is very elementary. You just need, uh, yeah, I mean, you will see it's very elementary. So for simplicity, let me assume the, the background is flat. In general, it will be the same. And then let me consider a sigma two equation just for simplicity, but it's, it's actually the same. So first, we, we have a cone condition. We have a sigma where it's positive. So if you just take the trace, you see immediately uh, easy uh, observation. That is a uh, gradient square. It's bounded by Laplace, and this is very important. Okay. And then we will use the Bernstein uh, technique. We take uh, this as our testing function, and uh, we try to say that, uh, okay, at the maximum point, we want to this is a negative semi-definite, and you multiply by ellipticity, then this should be negative. And you want to say some magic thing happens so that uh, it is bounded. That is Bernstein, Bernstein technique. And uh, there are two terms, U, K, K, I, Z, plus F, I, Z, U, K, I, U, K, Z. Okay. 
first one involving the fourth derivative, second one involving third derivative, up to third derivative. Okay. Okay. Oops. Could be too too high. So there are not uh, so many things you can do. I mean, this is just the. Uh, I mean, you have the equation, and uh, you have uh, this function at the maximum point. So the only thing you can do is that uh, you can use uh, the information you have to replace the formula. OK, that is. So the for the first term, so you, ha you can replace uh, fourth derivative by this, because you just uh, differentiate that. So use the formula of this, and uh, you know the gradient is 0, right? Maximum point. Just replace it. So simple algebra, you get the following. And along the way, you have to be very patient. You have to write down all the terms, because uh, it is the key part that you need to keep all the terms to see the cancellation. So this is just honest computation. For the second part, uh, you want to replace the third derivative. So you, re you use the formula of this to replacing the third derivative. So let this not hard. You just do the honors computation. JK. OK. So up to now, I have not used my equation yet. Nothing, just do under computation, replacing things. And then you see that here comes a magic con cancellation, because you see this one will cancel this one, and uh, this one will cancel out this one, and this one will cancel out this one. And what left are the good terms, because uh, you are we, are we are going to use the equation later. And uh, this one has a good sign. And this is a positive um, term. OK. So you see, after this cancellation, you want to use the equation, finally, and uh, put these two together. You see that. So I just copy it down. OK. And uh, by the concave key, this is greater or equal to the differentiation of the equation twice. This is by concavity. And the second one is just uh, just the differentiation of the equation. And then you have uh, the last one here. This is a positive. OK? And uh, it looks good, uh, but uh, not yet. Because uh, here you have a uh, Laplacian, at least. Here you have a gradient square, right? And uh, remember, I do not uh, assume. OK, I erase that. I, I do not uh, assume the gradient is bounded. I do not assume. But uh, I, uh, I erase some nice observation. That is, uh, gradient square is bounded by Laplacian. This is always hold. Both of them can be very large, but they always have this relation. So I can just use that to say that I get replacing everything by Laplacian. Then you get the following. And then you are done. Because uh, this is the leading term. This is square, and this is only uh, uh, has only power one. So as you, so you get the hash is bounded, and uh, as a result, gradient is also bounded. Okay. So that's how you get the uh, the interior situ estimate. Okay. So li this story is very good for the interior part. Now, how to deal with the boundary? Okay. Now back to one. So uh, re remember, the one is that you need to control the maximum uh, at the boundary. Uh, you want to control the boundary behavior. Okay. There are two steps. Uh, step one, we start from tangential part. You consider not the full Laplacian. This is just interior, right? You consider only the tangential part of the Laplacian and the tangential part of the gradient. Take this, and then you want to say that uh, this one increase to the interior. 
So it basically you take this function and uh, do the normal derivative uh, to the interior, and if that is positive, so you know that uh, this increase. Then you can, then, then you have hope, right? But not yet. Okay. So okay, the first uh, how to see that it increase. Uh, this is actually easier part. You just use the boundary condition. So remember, it's a normal boundary condition. So if you differentiate in a normal direction, you should use your boundary condition to say this is good. Okay, use the boundary condition. And the moreover, we are in the positive cone, so we have a gradient square is bounded by only the tangential Laplace. This is important. Okay, why? Because in order to make this work, you need this relation, right? But now I only take the tangential part. You are worried how to control the gradient. But uh, in the cone condition, you have uh, the tangential part already bound the gradient. And uh, now you need to go back to this computation, but use only tangential part and uh, do the computation very carefully to see that uh, the cancellation also holds for the tangential part. The tangential part, part cancel tangential part. And uh, then you, you have this nice re relation to replace everything. So now it will be only the, the tangential Haitian. So maybe I use the. At the end, you add only you get only tangential Haitian and the tangential Laplace, such and such. But the important thing is that this cancellation also hold for the tangential part. Okay, so this is step one. Uh, in fact, that is easier. Okay, so the the the, the more delicate part to, to control the normal. Okay, step two. You want to control the normal. So by the same spirit, you want to. This time you just take the whole. Laplace, and uh, you want to say this one uh, will increase to the interior, okay? And and of course the, the same the same spirit is that you want to take a normal derivative and say something, but this time it will be more com it will be more delicate because you have u and 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 ten. A, a priori you don't know how it behaves. It's not bounded, as I said. I mean the barrier function does not work. It's not bounded, but uh, we are going to say the following, this u n n is lower bounded compared to Laplace, and this n is uniform constant. Okay, and if you have this, it's easier to say this is okay. Yeah, but uh, here, the important thing is that uh, Laplace can be very large, and uh, this u n n can be very negative. Yeah. But uh, they have this relation, and this is enough for us to get the estimate. And how to get this? Uh, now we have to use the equation. It's not surprising that you want to do the differenti differentiation of the equation. Okay, and then there are some delicate estimate you want to, okay. So you know there's a one uh, n n power will give you this, but the other thing you want to control nicely, okay. And uh, we, we do such trick. I decompose into tangential part and the normal part, and I add some lower the term. I will explain why I add that later. And the that lower the term has no harm because I can use uh, the equation, it's a homogeneous. So I subtract this and then add uh, f back, f equal to minus e and exponential e to, so it's uh, equality, okay. So the, the, the reason is that uh, this is good, why, okay. So so one can just compute directly. You can see that the trace of this equal to zero. It's honest computation. But uh, you realize uh, how do I know that? Uh, I mean, of course, uh, it's from something else. So this is the second Bianchi. Of uh, the of the new metric of the G hat metric, second BRT of the G hat metric, and uh, of course you can just look on the computer. You see that this is zero. Okay, so let's say that uh, the major part of this vanish, but they are also smaller uh, error part error, because uh, if this is flat, if the background is flat, each one is zero. But uh, if it's on the manifold, this is only bounded, so we have error here. Yeah, because the trace is zero, but each one is just bounded, it's not vanished. Yeah, and uh, then you, then, but the let error can be estimated. 
So I just copy down that one. So let's say this one and this one are bounded already. Okay. So so I have to add some error, and the error turn turn out to be bounded. So this error turn would come here. And this is good because, uh, okay, I, I show you. So this is not too bad, I mean. Okay, so you just compute this. This one you have U and N, N. And this one at most Laplacian U. So at the end, you get the following. Uh, uh, okay, and then we are done because then that means, and this constant is uniform. So that means the uh, UN is uniformly bounded compared to Laplacian. And uh, after doing the honest computation here, you see that this function increases in the interior. And then you just do the interior estimate, as I showed you before, and, uh, to get the, the full gradient bound. OK, so I think uh, okay, I have two minutes. So OK, so if you are still alive, let me just uh, tell you what would happen if you want to you want to study the, the general case without assuming umbilic boundary. So the general case, so non umbilic. Okay. So there are two problems. One is geometrical. Eh, no. Geometric. One is analytical problem. Uh, as I mentioned, that uh, the whole skin can work because uh, the conformal invariant can, can distinguish upper hemisphere from non upper hemisphere. But if you are in this case, you have a problem. You need to find a conformal invariant such that uh, it can distinguish upper hemisphere. This is not uh, so easy as far as you know because uh, you want to find something on the boundary such that uh, it serves as this. Okay, and uh, of course the Gauss wave formula does not work because it's the invariant. So Gauss wave formula definitely not the invariant you are looking for. You need to find something similar to Gauss formula, but not Gauss formula. Okay, and the analytical and the then analytical problem will be following. You need to deal with a tangential Hessian on the boundary. So as I mentioned, uh, the the general case, the boundary condition involving tangential Hessian. So you need to deal with that boundary condition. Okay, so I think I stop here. Thank you for your attention. Blow up analysis. Blow up. <laughs>